Wow, were they ever coming online? Look at them go. <laughs> Hello, everybody who's uh, just logging on and joining us. Uh, we'll be starting in about five minutes. And we're just now uh, waiting for people to log on to the system. Bienvenue tout le monde. On va commencer en environ cinq minutes. Alors, on attend que tout le monde s'inscrive au webinaire. Okay. Hello, everybody. Just a quick reminder that uh, we'll be starting in about uh, three minutes. Uh, so to everybody who's just logging on, uh, just be patient uh, uh, with us while we uh, open the room to all the guests. That's right. <laughs> Hello again, everybody. Bonjour tout le monde. We are still, um, there's still people logging on to the webinar, so we'll just get started in a few moments. Um, tout le monde, on va attendre quelques moments que les gens s'inscrivent au webinar. On va commencer très bientôt. Everybody, I think we'll just give it one more minute. We have a large, large group of uh, participants today and we just want to give everybody the chance to log in.
right, uh, Sue and Virginia, uh, if you're ready, um, I think we'll get started in the interest of uh, staying on time. Uh, so welcome everybody uh, to this uh, webinar series, Bienvenue tout le monde à la série de webinaires. We're so pleased uh, that you joined us today and uh, this series of webinars is proving very popular. Uh, so just before we get started, um, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. Um, so I'll ask all of you to place your feet on the ground and breathe the air at your location. We acknowledge that we're gathering today from coast to coast to coast on the lands of First Nations, Inuit and Métis people and their governments. We acknowledge that the head office of the CSLA is in unceded Algonquin and Anishinaabek territory and the head office of the AALA, which is our partner for this uh, initiative, is in Treaty 6, Métis Region 4. Uh, my name is Michelle Legault, and on behalf of myself and the Executive Director of AALA, uh, Todd Reed, we'd like to welcome you to this uh, webinar series. This series features speakers who were scheduled to speak at the cancelled uh, June 2020 Congress, uh, which was um, supposed to be in Calgary. Um, we're going to proceed with the presentation, and I would encourage you to ask questions either via the chat box or the Q&A feature. Um, there will be time at the end for discussion. Um, and in addition, the recording will be available on the CSLA website. Now, you're participating today in a Zoom webinar, which means that you can only see the speakers and not all of the participants. So it's slightly different than a Zoom meeting platform. So our speakers today, um, I'd like to welcome uh, Virginia Burt and Sue Sears, uh, who are presenting Creating Moments in Time, Adding Meaning and Depth to Everyday Practice. Virginia Burt um, is principal of Virginia Burt Designs. She specializes in healing landscapes and gardens, labyrinths and sacred spaces for private residential and public clients. Her work has achieved international recognition for master planning, private gardens and healthcare projects, receiving multiple national awards from the ASLA, the CSLA, Palladio and others. Virginia is one of only seven women in the world elected to fellowship in both the ASLA and CSLA for her outstanding contributions. The importance of healing environments was relatively unknown in 1996 when Virginia opened the doors of her own firm. And she developed a holistic approach that attends to our physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual aspects while weaving the meaning of landscapes, genius loci, stakeholder input into evidence-based design. Virginia intensifies ways of working with organizations and public clients to address the diverse needs of the population they serve. In her project work, Virginia attends to the craft of landscape architecture with attention to detail and how things are made. Sue is principal at Outside Landscape Architects, an international award-winning firm dedicated to innovative landscape design with a focus on creating amazing outdoor spaces. Sue is a year-round athlete and avid traveler, and her projects reflect her sense of adventure and love of the outdoors. Areas of practice include design for public spaces and amenities, living walls and green roofs, green building design, landscape restoration, and urban design. Projects are infused with a sense of character that respect the site, creating contemporary outdoor environments, often with a playful twist on traditional design. And so I turn it over to Virginia and Sue uh, for this webinar. I hope you enjoy it. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I wanna be able to say, first of all, thank you for attending. What a pleasure it is to be here. Um, we have a problem. Can we start back at the beginning? Sue, there was something there that happened, if we could please. And okay, all right, there we go. As always, a Zoom meeting presentation has its own moments. And so we're talking about creating moments in time today and adding meaning and depth to everyday practice. So Sue and I have both agreed and, and Sue, you know, jump in anytime. We I'd are living- in Yeah, just to say hello from sunny Halifax today. Mm -hmm. We're, you know, as we sat down to uh, prepare this particular presentation, what of course we all realize is the conversation has changed. Mm -hmm. um, upper left, the uh, Montreal Symphony Orchestra playing at the airport to a drive-in uh, to Vancouver, um, and it's socially distant uh, aerial photographs of people 
to doing street parties in some manner, shape or form to bring joy to all ages. And of course, we're all being welcomed to Nova Scotia, except for this. <laughs> so long as you're quarantined for 14 days, <laughs> you're more than welcome to visit. <laughs> and what we realize is, of course, we've become archetypal islands. I've spoken about uh, the seven landscape archetypes that I work in, and this particular one, what you see here, of course, the artist who's done the work at uh, the High Line with their socially distant dots, paintings, circles in public parks, doing yoga in a bubble, um, to eating in a little, we, we are islands, even though, um, and, and how do we make these fun? How do we, how do we attach meaning to very challenging time in our history? We said in our initial presentation submission back a year ago that we wanted to talk about some of the amazing research that's being done in nature, in neuroscience, in psychiatry and environmental psychology. And uh, what Virginia has just talked about, that transition this past year, so much change has happened that you'll see a fair bit of COVID in reference here too, not just COVID, uh, but many things have taken our attention with political changes around the world, Black Lives Matter, global pandemic. I'm calling it the great global pause this year. So you'll see that referenced. Edward O. Wilson, of course, in Biophilia, you know, he, he literally has um, encapsulated with his words about nature holding the key. And I think that uh, when we speak about and, and biophilia really, if we speak of it, it's a powerful way of understanding and examining the bond that we as humans has, have with other species and living systems. So if you could take a moment and breathe this photo in, seeing the ocean, the rocks, trees, grass. And this is what NASA if you were, this is what Houston would know. Your heart rate just went down. Your blood pressure just went down. Your salivary cortisol went down. Your mental outlook improved and your muscle tension reduced. This is what we know when astronauts would look gaze at a scene in nature. In particular, when we look at scenes that have water in them, um, when we have scenes that have, of course have trees, when we are immersed in woods, we know that this happens. So the power of nature. Ulrich's 1984 land, literally a, a seminal piece of research. Suddenly we realized that a view of nature decreases analgesic use, so we can handle pain better. Um, Claire Cooper Marcus, of course, in her work, 68 to 88% felt calmer and more relaxed. People feel $10,000 richer with Berman's work in 2015. But what we really know is productivity increases when we have views of nature from our office. We have plants, children do better, crime rates decrease. We save money in healthcare. Um, all of these things have become equated. So, Considering that, we also, oh, well, actually there's one other piece here, but we also know in one of our great crises in our forests right now of, of the Emerald Ash Borer, the US Forest Service actually did a study, said that 20,000 additional deaths occurred when all of those ash trees got taken down. But it's also fascinating about the subtler details um, that, that it, it, the health benefits stem from trees planted on the streets and in the front yards where people can access them as they walk by. So public space has taken on new meaning. Nature. And if you're not familiar with what a doshen smile is, it's the one that makes your eyes crinkle when you, <laughs> when you do, when you really do. But here's the thing, you also stand closer to the person who delivered them, whether you know them or not. 
you feel happier, calmer, a more intimate connection with the person who gave them to you. More importantly, the next time and when we are finally back to being able to take gifts to dinner parties, take flowers, they'll remember it for years after, rather than taking a book or some sort of hostess gift. Flowers are the ticket. So let's just look at some of this. Imagine for a moment, the flowers that we see in a tulip tree or at another season, those same flowers as a snow cone. When I was a kid growing up, my mother had a career in neuroscience. It's a it, and a fascination and a love for Star Trek. And she always talked at the dinner table about how neuroscience was the the la the human brain was the last frontier. And I'm fascinated as uh, as you know throughout my years of practice that this has really come true. There's been so much information that's evolved uh, that we know now that can you be used to inform our practice. Mom did a presentation on brain surgery and all the different stages of brain surgery. And what she did was intersperse every slide of neuroscience uh, of neurosurgery with a picture of her garden. Garden. And she did that because she knew people would pay attention to the garden. They could focus. There was better learning when she did that. It informed my life for sure. Uh, and my interest of sci in science, it's, it's a base for me to start from, right? It's an understanding, a framework. And I know in this past year, we have used this front part of our brain, the prefrontal cortex. It's the part that does all of the executive function work. It's, it's where we get our creativity from. It's the hub of creativity, not the only part, but it's the hub. It's all our critical thinking, problem solving, decision making. Think about how much we've had to adopt and change over the course of this year. Multitasking, it also drains that multitasking piece is really important. I've been curious about David Strayer's work. He does a lot of research in this field from the from Utah University. Um, and uh, he's he's because we've all been called to research uh, or to do the multitasking this year to a far greater extent as we adapt our processes and protocols and figure out how to manage the kids while we're working from home. So what turns out though is that only 2% of us can actually multitask well. That's not many of us. That's vast majority of us on this call cannot multitask. But our efforts to do that are wasting about 25% of our work day. That's a big deal. What he did was, was take two groups of of um, participants and had them take the same walk through an arboretum. He uh, had one group leave all their digital uh, technology behind, including their earphones, that listening to music. That wasn't okay, no cell phones, nothing. The second group, same walk, he asked them to uh, talk on a phone call the whole time. These EEGs were taken 20 minutes later. You can see the one on the left is green. It is showing low theta activity. It is showing a rested brain. The one on the right-hand side, the red one, is showing a high level of activity, no restoration benefit. The brain is still working even 20 minutes later. Think about that. Uh, the other key thing is that people only remembered half of what they saw when they were on their cell phone at the same time. So next time you're out walking in the woods, you might be getting your fitness value, but think about it. Which one of these things would you rather not see or you, you may not have seen? There's such a thing as brain, a smartphone induced brain drain. I, again, I found this really very, very interesting and applicable. Even having the presence of my phone around um, is, is actually draining my cognitive abilities, which might explain why I love swimming so much. Uh, ocean swimming, nobody can reach me. You cannot contact me. There are no disruptions. It is a lovely thing. One of the things in this past year in particular that I have found incredibly restorative. Another thing is uh, my work with the Mi'kmaq community here and a beautiful term, two-eyed seeing from Elder uh, Albert Marshall from Eskazoni community. They are asking us to use two lenses 
two-eyed seeing, our Western, blending our Western way of, of understanding and our knowledge. So that's all our botanical names and how we understand plants with indigenous ways of knowing, with greater interconnectedness, more holistic, non-hierarchical. And the medicinal plant component, my same Acadian forest community, I am looking at with a wonderful new set of eyes, Gold thread on the on the side um, image is is the uh, me walking around looking at my Acadian forest in a whole new way. And most importantly, there's a spiritual connection here that felt really valuable, but I also felt better uh, walking around in the forest. The Mayo Clinic says kids should have no more than two hours of on-screen time. Think about that in this past year. How much time have we all spent on our computers, on our digital technology? Notice that it dampens creativity. That's a big deal for us in our work world. Of course, we have to turn to the grandfather for a brief moment, just to look at it and recognize that the enjoyment of scenery employs the mind without, mind without fatigue. And, you know, this whole idea of creating a refreshing rest and reinvigoration to the whole system. This is, of course, his introduction to Yosemite and the Mariposa Grove, um, but it still holds true today. It's really how we speak about all how do we create a greater sense of time and happiness for ourselves? How we might feel more generous is what the studies show, how it can make you healthier. So, and you know, although we're saying ourselves, this is also exposing your clients to the same. And when we feel awe, okay, keep going. So, you know, this, this speck in the, Northwest Territories of what I feel like as we go to visit the off ice, um, just that sense of awe to look at just the, the absolute grandness of it. And how we might go to remote places, appreciate a sunset. And what we know, here's a, here's the thing <laughs> about spaces in nature, Three overarching mind-body systems get, get a benefit. Cognitive functionality and performance, psychological and physiological, so the health and well-being. What we know is that there's another piece here, folks. I often speak about it, not everybody wants to, but I will say in my world, a fourth one happens. It is our spiritual health and well-being. We walk this mystical path as landscape architects. We walk it with practical feet. What are the things that help us stimulate the mystical part of our being, of being able to take that forward, the magic of what happens when we do design work? And how do we translate that into design? To me, you know, I'm a big fan of John Roger and John Morton, and it really is being able to be, to have practical spirituality. It's the thing that helps us touch in a moment another person. It might make us smile, it make it, but it helps us do one thing and one thing only, in my opinion. The start of it is uplifting myself so I can uplift others. Take care of myself so I can take care of others. Keep going. And spatial configurations matter in this kind of thing. So when we're the next time designing be it a park, a home, a place. Think about these things. Prospect, an unimpeded view, reduces stress, proven to be so, 2010. The next one, refuge. <laughs> you actually get reduced boredom and fatigue. You have improved concentration, perception of safety and attention, or well, and I'll say in the world of mystery, it induced a strong pleasure response because we're, we're promising that next thing of being able to take people forward. And then of course, risk and peril. Um, you know, these days an identifiable threat uh, coupled with a reliable safeguard. But I think it's really, it, it results in a strong dopamine or pleasure response. 
And so examples of this include prospect. Go ahead. Long and short views. Those long and short views, by the way, less than six meters isn't considered prospect just FYI, so going for the bigger view. The second one, refuge. Um, of course, I'm, I'm using a, a Winnipeg version. Of course, we have to have winter in our pictures, but here's the other part. I'll just say, uh, that's Walgren on the, on the right. This gentleman um, wrote, if you, and if you haven't read it, The Secret Life of Trees. Um, keep going, Sue. Improving our tension, concentration, that there's mystery. The piece here, please click. We have a great amount of pleasure knowing that we want to go that next step around the next curve. And if you could go forward. And then risk or peril, the Canadian side of the Niagara Falls, being able to step to that very edge, perhaps roller, roller sorry, wrong, skateboarding on the uh, whale sculpture in Halifax or perhaps going over a narrow bridge over a 15 foot um, height. But it, what happens for us is we, we have pleasure when we've done that. And it takes us into a bit about play. Go ahead. What we know is that nature connects us. And uh, here, Tai Chi in a public place called Itabashi Garden, it is the connective tissue. Even in our hardscape, would be, and I look at this and I think of our cities and look at how the green gets to fill in the cracks and connect us, keep going. And Thoreau, we need this tonic of wildness. And at the same time, um, we earn us to explore and learn. Can we ever have enough of nature? To me, when I think of it, when we think about play, when we think about how in places that we create as landscape architects, how do we do rewilding and how do we best do that? Keep going. <laughs> well, so less than 5% of their day, Americans, 30% of Canadians spend less than five minutes inside in their day. I think that um, we have some work to do folks. What do we really know? It takes 120 minutes or 8% of your day for people to feel like they stay healthy. How can you convince your clients, the people who attend your parks, to be out there for 120 minutes? And the other part is, of course, two hours a week in a green space. They're and this is a, that was an excellent in England, substantially more likely to report good health and psychological well-being than those that don't. But two hours a week was hard. There were no benefits really shown or they couldn't measure them, let's say it that way, um, if they were out there for less. And there's research that talks about the three day effect in nature. If you're lucky enough to be able to hike down into the canyon, this one in Grand Gulch or somewhere else uh, where you can actually leave your technology behind. The research supports you taking that kind of time. The benefits, it takes us that kind of time to disconnect and our brain comes out rested and we have a 50% increase in creativity. That's astounding. If I could do my work in half the time, who's not going to sign up for that? It's interesting, though, um, this piece around the Wi-Fi. This is a project site. Um, in a, by, no, by no means am I saying that we shouldn't be using our Wi-Fi everywhere. But I realize I'm starting as a landscape architect to have very different conversations with diff different people about the technology the and and because they've been putting we've been putting wi-fi in outside all over the place and additional technology um television screens uh clients request um outdoor sound systems that kind of thing here um in some of our rural nova scotia incredible uh, properties 
I realized I actually need to have the conversation to talk about the benefits of not having technology in some of these places. A very different conversation from our, our um, clients that have um, our public clients where we actually do really need internet service. High density communities like this one rely on our additional um, USB ports and electrical outlets and all those things during storm activity. When the libraries are shut because of pandemics, we need that. So, but I'm very interested that there's a conversation happening in my head um, around uh, technology and how we use it in, in natural environments. The learning piece, um, lots to support views and exposure to or being outside for learning benefits. One thing I want to highlight on this slide, though, is that the views to trees and shrubs are the things that are the benefit. It's not the same benefit, but same learning outcome for um, kids that just or people that are just looking at sod. We need more. And there needs to be a degree of naturalness associated with that. Attention and restoration theory. So ART uh, was put forward uh, years ago by the Kaplans, um, but many, many researchers are building on the work that they've done, including uh, Strayer's work with the brain scans that we saw earlier. There is a lot in this work um, and a lot emerging from this work. But one piece I wanna talk about is soft and hard fascination. So watching our um, slide presentation is focused, hard attention, right? We're very focused. And uh, soft attention is gazing out to nature, being in nature, um, feeling that breeze on your face, that, re that relaxed brain span. This is looking at bandwidth. So if you're feeling like you've done a lot over the course of the last year and your bandwidth is a little short and you're trying to figure out how to restore it, this was an interesting study. To, it looked at four different ways to restore your bandwidth. Um, your phone, scrolling through your scroll, phone at the end of the day, checking social media, TV, home, and nature. So your perceived restorative benefit and the, um, the actual band, mental bandwidth improvements. And hands down, being out in nature was the thing that improved people's sense of, of improving their mental bandwidth, their capacity to, to carry on and do more. So one of the things you know we, we had talked about in in is is how do we add how do we do this ourselves how do we prepare ourselves to take this journey as Mary Oliver says there's little the creatively inclined person can do except to prepare body and spirit for the labor to come and I will just say to you rather than binging on Bridgerton instead of looking at a picture like this or simply going for a walk. Um, you know, I recognize in some ways it seems so simplistic, yet as we, Sue and I delved into this deeper and deeper and deeper, it truly is that simple, is how you bring forward your spirit using meditation, being able to use nature to help you do that. Um, keep going soon and I, I i don't want to digress so you know and is it enough to uh, walk on the treadmill with a plant perhaps not um, however if you keep going what we know uh, is that we get elevated when we get green exercise and um, you know, my concern of course also goes that the iq gains in developed natures are not uh, in developed nations are not only leveling off. Um, the research is now showing that it's almost declining as the fitness declines and screen moves in. Um, in the world of COVID-19, our screen time, I don't know if you get your little, uh, um, how many hours you've spent per day on average every week, I get one of those little notifications. And I'll just say, uh, we need to be able to do this differently and continue to do it differently, but to do it intentionally and to make the right kinds of choices that support you to be able to be your best self and show up, keep going. I, so Expo 67, I would be the little girl in that dory. Um, this is a Cornelia von Oberlander seminal piece, of course, but 
really what it's talking about. And uh, I actually played in that dory. My father, when he went to take me inside, because it was really, if you know the story about this playground, it was an afterthought, um, because this is a waiting area for them to go in and do this special cognitive testing that they wanted to do on children. Um, and yet this became the most popular area of the entire thing. But unself-conscious unself play, being immersed in an outdoor activity and simply engaged back to the same thing, soft fascination. And yet having a little bit of risk, um, you can see the boat is, uh, you know, you're gonna get wet if you fall out. <laughs> Keep going. And I'm particularly interested in the research around adults at play, um, because I think it's one of the things we don't talk about enough. And it's one of the things I think people are longing for. Um, Nova Scotia has this wonderful surf and here I am with my pals sneaking off uh, to catch the best surf. That brings us joy to play with a goofy little board, to play in the water. It serves no obvious purpose, except it's really fun and it brings a human connection when we play. It's also excellent rest for the brain. Um, I'm interested too that our clients are seeking out more playful things too. Maybe it's just the work that I'm involved in. Um, but I notice, I feel like it, my inner four-year-old snuck out on a number of our projects. Jerome the gnome, the submarine playground, those kinds of things are truly sort of harkening back to a fun and playful element. But it's what I'm learning uh, that watching the kids is a really great way to go because they do it naturally. Um, and giving ourselves permission and our clients permission to spend time in that oversized hammock, maybe with your kids, watching the sunset, enjoying that time and knowing that it's, it's okay to have that downtime and, and bringing more of that into our work. I think that uh, as we move into this, and if you could please advance, um, you know, again, Mary Oliver, round me the trees stir in their leaves and call out, stay a while. Uh, the light flows from their branches and they call again, it's simple, they say. And you too have come into the world to do this, to go easy, to be filled with light and to shine. And if you could go to the next slide, I often speak about uh, meditation and how important being able to find your time, your time to fill up so that you have enough to give. And you know, it's it's a micro scale thing that they are now so aware of. Um, and again, research shows quiet time, not on a not on a handheld device, but quiet time, because there's of course lots of apps for that too. Um, but <laughs> consider just being able to breathe and breathe on your own quietly for a moment looking outside. I also speak about intention and being able to um, become more aware of having the intention of anchoring more light, of being able to, we long for connection. Um, we long for the idea. And, and it's such simple things to, to consider making and having a smile yourself and being able to, when you smile yourself, you invite others to smile with you. Um, I often say to the folks in my office, you know, it, it, by adding a little bit of humor, one goes a long way and it helps us journey. We take it seriously, sure. But we also have to journey with these, and I'm going to call it sacred trusts that we have with our clients, of being able to come forward with the best work that we can give. And so where intention goes, energy flows. So I need you to, yeah, thanks. Um, the, uh, you know, and, and, and when we capture, this is a piece about capturing, capturing moments and appreciating moments. Um, we're moving pretty fast these days. How do we be able to create a little bit of a pause? And have you been outside today? 
Have you just gone outside just to breathe the air, have the sunshine on your face for a brief moment? Reach for the sky, um, putting forward intention of being and making a richer life for yourself and for others. So, how do we become more keenly aware of the way the outdoors truly affects us? How can we offer that true connection to nature? The next time we're specifying things, look towards natural materials, look towards making choices of biophilia, of patterns that engender nature. Tolkien says it well, as soon as Frodo says, I wish it need not have happened in my time. His response, paraphrased, all we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. As we reflect on the research that we've done and how we can take this into practice, it's interesting to think about how you might, how we might be able to incorporate more time into our, for reflection into our lives, but not just our own. Um, the clients that we serve and the, the extension of the work that we do into the broader community, how can we, how can we bring more um, reflection time into our own lives so we're better able to, to meet those, those goals? Um, how can we figure out how to spend more time outside? What's, what, what, what do, might we need to do to make that happen? Is it possible to leave our phones behind and our technology behind more often? I think about these things and I, I noticed one example that I've had this year that just makes me laugh um, is I was pretty tied to those COVID numbers in the early days and watching them and watching them. And um, I, I mean, obviously that's, that's not a great way to spend my time, but somehow the, you know, Netflix and the, the technology that we have can be quite addictive. So I've decided to, I have switched up my daily check of COVID numbers uh, for a check-in with the daily otter, um, which is a global network of happy otter photos from around the world. It makes me smile. It cheers me up. Um, and I can move on with a little smile on my face. You know, um, one of the things as creatives, all of us um, who are attending today, is that it takes courage. It takes courage to be a creative that takes courage to stand before people and speak of things of the heart. It takes courage to create your own world. You know, Georgia O'Keeffe, such a, such a great inspiration. And so where do we turn? And, and the piece for me, and you may have noticed in our presentation, we have intentionally every other slide included a photograph of nature, of being able to call you, I'm going to call, call us, call all of us, to the level of appreciation that is deeper. That's all. The appreciation of, of others, the appreciation of ourselves, of us as beings, of us being able to add meaning to the smallest thing um, and having the courage to create that world of that inner world because if you can create it in your inner world, you create it in your outer world. And on that note, we that wonderful note, we'd like to conclude with a thank you and a wide open invitation to come to CSLA Congress 2022 in Halifax. Um, by then we are hoping that our, our conferences will will be back in person because let's face it we need our people time face-to-face -face time and uh we of course in the maritimes are known for our kitchen parties and we need we need a really good kitchen party coming out of this time so we look forward to seeing you here in halifax come the blazes to nova scotia <laughs> and thank you so much sue and virginia and it's <laughs> part of me 
<laughs> Thank you so much for that great invitation and that great presentation. <laughs> <laughs> and at this point, I'm going to stop screen sharing, uh, Michelle, and let you take the questions and we're sure. delighted to, to respond. Thank you so much. That was really so engaging and so interesting. Um, and those nature photos, just they really do it. They really lower your heart rate. So thank you for sharing that with us and all that beauty. Um, if anybody has any questions or any discussion, um, please do ask through the chat. You can also use the question and answer. Uh, feature um, and uh, I can relay your questions to Virginia and to Sue. Um, and if you are uh, wanting to learn more about the uh, 2022 Congress, we're going to be sharing information very soon, but it is June 9th uh, to the 11th uh, in Halifax. And after canceling the 2020 Congress and then going virtual in May 2021, uh, I think we'll need a, a really good kitchen party. So I'm ready for it, uh, uh, Sue. So uh, it, maybe even in your kitchen, we'll see. Bring your, bring your fiddle, Michelle. <laughs> I play a guitar, actually. I'll bring that. Perfect. Perfect. I'm going to be so, in the fire pit. I'm going to be in the fire pit on the beach, close to the woods, just everybody knows. <laughs> so we've had a few. Uh, Mindy Tyndall uh, said, phenomenal presentation. Very inspiring. I uh, love the anecdote about the brain surgery. Um, Karen in the Northwest Territories is um, wondering if we could give the reference again to the 120 minutes a day in nature. Um, and so that's one of the slides that we could, we'll, we'll share after, um, we'll be putting this online. Um, but did you want to uh, recap that 120 minutes a day in nature um, uh, slide for Karen? I'm just gonna go back to it. I know that we have that. Uh... And while you're looking for that, um, we have uh, some thanks coming in. Um, people saying they're gonna be there in 2022 and wouldn't <laughs> miss it. Um, have comments like an awesome presentation, soothing presentation, uh, a great reminder to maintaining our connection to nature. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I forgot a stat we didn't get mentioned while well, Virginia's pulling up her um, uh, slide there is that the, there's recent research to 2020, late 2020 research that's showing that of 7,000 COVID transmissions, only five of them happened outside. And I think that over this time, that connection back to nature is, uh, you know, people are longing for it. We're, we're seeing people getting outside that really have never done it before. We're getting calls and asking, ask, people asking us to help make the connection back to nature. And so it's, a, but it was a really great stat. It's great for the profession. Um, you know, when we see those kinds of numbers saying it's, we're better off outside. Yeah. It is, it's the Matthew White of the European Center for Environment and Human Health, University of Exeter. It is all on the slide. Okay, just so that for that person, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing who it was that actually asked that question. So I'll just it's say- Karen. Yep, it's Karen okay. Lagerly Ham in uh, Northwest Territories. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. But it we is also on have, that slide, so it'll be posted, right, Michelle? It will, we'll be posting that. Um, we also have Ian Robertson in the Yukon asking, how do you address noise in your design work given the focus of this wonderful presentation? Mm -hmm. I'll tell, I, uh, I will respond with, with one thing that I find. Um, I think that the first piece is, is when I can't see the source of sound, I find that that is helpful, right? So I use screening visually to help that next layer, which is the being able to actually screen sound. Um, when we do that, um, and of course, you, <laughs> we talk about water when we can, um, but I think that it's really about creating focus and that becomes a very important piece. So um, being able to focus on other things and that is, it's, it's really, I mean, other than noise attenuation, it is also um, being able to focus on other things. And so natural distractions are Excellent for that. Now I see Josh Weber says Aspen makes a great chatter. So does uh, corn in the in the winter. Um, 
Yes, now, right. do we have, uh, can you recommend particular, I'm seeing one here that says particular publications, pub publications that cover all or most of the points. Mm. Um, we've created a bibliography. Um, is there only one? Uh, there's not really only one, yeah. Alan, but what I'll say to you is uh, um, one that I have found fascinating that I read about uh, five years ago is Your Brain on Nature by Shaloub and um, I'm trying to think of the other person. Um, we will be, we'll supply a bibliography to um, Michelle. So you're, you're gonna have that. We have, we have a whole, it's quite a, quite a long, list so <laughs> we will send that to you we also have shannon uh, who asks can you please share some strategies for convincing clients about the importance of opportunities for nature connection in your design work i'd i'd love to chat about this because this sometimes is very difficult to do and um i spoke a tiny bit about it but you know when we have uh, all of the electronics to put outside. The, I, I can speak to a, an example where we have clients who want to put large amounts of outdoor sound equipment in place. You know, I'm, I work beside the sea. They've got the sounds, the wonderful sounds of the ocean right there beside them. And they're covering them with, with um, piped in music. Lovely idea, great intention to have music for many of it. But to, to actually stand, what I do is stand there with people in silence. Um, and it can be uncomfortable standing in silence. But as soon as you start to point out the sound of those stones rolling along the shore, the action of the waves, the feel of that, the, the movement and the sound, it's, it is a helpful tool to stand in silence, even though sometimes awkward. Um, I'm watching a few things. Thanks, Sue. Um, I'm watching a few things. Has anyone ever quantified the benefits of different types of gardens, formal versus wild? Um, mm -hmm. Yes, there are a few references to that. I will say, um, and you notice that we touched on it about the students learning that a formal or a grass panel does not do the job, <laughs> right? It's trees and shrubs of being able to have a various scales of plants, as well as being able to integrate um, those four other items, the, uh, the prospect refuge of being able to in instill mystery and, um, and peril. So, uh, or risk peril. Um, I, I will just say, I have come across it. I will need to go back to find it to be able to give you an exact reference. But yes, indeed, there are. Um, no, no matter what, gardens, first of all, for, first and foremost, green spaces intentionally made will definitely um, counterbalance the urban. Okay, so different types of gardens. I'll, I'll see if I can find that next piece. Um, Beautiful scenery creation could help in high density societies as well, like in cities where it's mainly people living in apartments. I think regardless, um, so that's to Elham, I think it is. Um, I'll just say it this way. <laughs> Every inch needs in, as our cities become more and more dense, as we move into the cities, I mean, I grew up on a farm. There's so many people who no longer even know where the chicken comes from in the grocery store. So I will just say to you, um, for people in apartments, as much community garden work, as much adding and teaching how people can grow and grow their own thing, um, there's just so many aspects to being able to involve people in their, and I'm going to call it greening of their community. Um, it's, it's never more important, like just painting uh, the top of a building green with a green roof is not enough. It's just not enough. We've got to be able to look at this and be able to start to attach. How important, I mean, I'm working on a project right now um, where there's 
the architects came to us and said, gee, we want to put landscape first. I was like, wow, I'm using references from 30 years ago <laughs> because it's stuff that we know, that we know as landscape architects. So I'll just say, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a question from uh, Selena as well, who asks, do you make mindfulness and meditation a conscious part of your workday or is that better done at home separate from the practice? Hello, Selena. <laughs> good, to, good to see you online. Um, I can speak to this in the sense that I do have a practice at home and I find my work days very busy. Um, they're, they're rich and full. Um, and while this is important to me, having a practice, I, we, the office doesn't have a practice, if that's what you're asking. Although we have views, we have views to nature from our windows. So that piece is really important and I use it. I look out my window. Right now I am looking at a sun that will be setting in an hour and a half. It is still high. I see my uh, maple trees, um, elm trees, ash trees out my window. And I use that as a reference um, for those calming moments when I need them. Um, Donna, thank you. Could you write a book for landscape architects? <laughs> sure. sure. Be happy to. And, I, and I'll say, you know, and you know, I've recently moved my office from my home, but I'll say this, every day is started by getting up 20 minutes before I think I should to do meditation first. Um, why? Because it sets up my day. And do I do it in the office? Yeah, you know what we, um, in, we, well, I go outside. That's how I do it. I put on my coat and hat and I head outside even if it's for five minutes, like I did before this, um, you know, uh, the days are indeed very, very busy. And just being able to take the time, I think we, and for those of us who are in private practice, we're busy being working to be as efficient and as fast as we can be at things. Um, one of the statistics that didn't get said is when you are interrupted, it takes 40 minutes for you to get back to where you were when you're in the midst of a design process or in the midst of, but it takes 40 minutes in a world where we count those minutes. It's important that we have quiet time. Mm -hmm. We have time that we don't get interrupted. I'm not sure that I'm perfect at it for sure, <laughs> but it remains an intention. I'm following, following the chat here and just backing up to Joanne um, and taking that pause in the moment like Virginia was talking about in the morning. Um, uh, Joanne, you mentioned that you're a former resident of St. Margaret's Bay and indeed that uh, first slide of the winter shore um, is in fact Seabright in Nova Scotia where I spend my morning meditation time either in the water or on the shore and it's incredibly restorative. So you should come home sometime soon. <laughs> so we have a lot of questions in the Q&A as well. Um, and um, oh, a few minutes left, but uh, Barbara has um, an interesting question. She asks, uh, do you have any sense that our recovery from the pandemic and the desire to return to normal will, be, will include more time in nature than people have gotten used to? And can you suggest how designers can help to encourage that direction? Okay, so Sue and I probably both want to speak to this, don't we? <laughs> yes, <laughs> go first. Um, okay, uh, um, so, so Barbara, I would say, first of all, yes. Um, you know, I, I have so many things running through my head, I have silence, okay? So, so just a moment here, but I'll just say this. I think people, the conversation has changed. I think that um, where, and I'm gonna say it this way, where developers have just looked at things and said, what kind of amenities can we provide for people? Suddenly they are like, how do we create places and spaces that people will enjoy nature? It's a different conversation because people are outside craving it. You know, this, uh, I saw somebody with the chat saying that um, multi-use trails have tripled. 
Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just down the road from the conservation authority where they are now taking, it's just like booking a golf game, you book your, your walk. Mm -hmm. um, and quite frankly, they are so busy. They've never been as successful as they are now. And I think it has changed the conversation. Um, and, and I think that, that, you know, th this whole idea, you know, will it take us 10 years to get back to, somebody said to me, oh, it's going to take us 10 years to forget. And I thought to myself, wow, I think more than anything else, people have realized how important it is to get outside. Because mm -hmm. they're, they, when, you, when you are mandated to be at home, I don't think gardens have ever looked so good for many of my clients, frankly. Because they're outside to yeah. it. Anyway. Um, the, okay, Sue, you go. There's interesting research too that's showing that um, for those of us who regularly got outside uh, pre-COVID and had a regular exercise act, you know, routine, stuck to it, um, COVID hit us pretty hard. Um, and we, a lot of people were, had a hard time keeping up those routines. The opposite was also true. People that didn't normally go outside um, spent more time outside. And I found that really interesting. I'm aware in my, in my, um, in the work that we're doing right now, I am dealing with calls where people are longing for more information about the land that is around them. Um, and, uh, you know, I was just hired to literally walk in talk about the land just come and share with them what was on the property a residential property what is it about what are the trees what should we look for how do we benefit from this how do we get restorative value um, out of the forest mm -hmm. we already have great questions thanks carolyn lovely words i'm so appreciating all the folks who are sending chats yeah it's wonderful to see <laughs> So we are uh, running out of time. We might have mm -hmm. time for one more uh, question. Um, there's some of the Q&A that's coming in here, which is really interesting as well. Um, Wei asks if you have any experience in designing healing gardens by working with native plants and playful elements. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, that would be the, accurate. The answer is yes, yeah. with a big Y. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, yes. Look at yes, it. Uh, yes is a complete answer. <laughs> yes is a complete answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so what we'll do is um, there might be lots more questions you can think of. Um, if there's something specific you'd like to ask uh, Virginia and Sue, you can always send me an email and I will forward it to them. Um, and uh, I'm the executive dash director at CSLA uh, email address that invades your, your inbox on a fairly regular basis. Um, so to both of you ladies, oh, thank you so much for such an engaging presentation. I think we really felt this one personally. I know there were several moments there where I thought, oh yes, I see that in my children, or I see that in my family, or I see it when we go to the cottage. Um, so thank you very much for something that uh, really, really has, uh, has touched, us, uh, touched us all. Um, the next event in this series um, is on March 11th um, at 2.30 p.m. where Jeanette Cha will present um, towards a model of planning and management of large urban parks. Um, this presentation will actually be given en français and the webinar will be made available after with uh, subtitles following the presentation. So you'll be able to hear it uh, in person um, in French and then uh, after in English. And um, thank you to everybody who joined us today. Uh, we are a large group of participants, and so we're so pleased uh, with, uh, with your participation today. And again, a big uh, round of applause, if we could, uh, to Sue and uh, to Virginia for your great presentation. Thank you, thank ladies. You. Thank you, everybody. So appreciate all of your words. And uh, I'm just like, this is my heart fills just to see so many people. You can just tell you're smiling. So go out there and keep doing it. Uh, <laughs> carry so you on. can hear a smile. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like everybody's just, I'm just watching. They're just like, whoa, come on. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Uh, Totally great session to have with you guys. I wish we were at the conference and could share a lovely walk outside. Take care. Merci tout le monde. Everybody have a great afternoon.